now CSP. So welcome everybody and uh, let's dive right in Professor Schiffman. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I should say this morning, I think it's still morning for you even though it's afternoon for me. And we're going to be spending three sessions on the scrolls and hopefully going into sufficient uh, detail that you'll come away with a much wider understanding of why it's really so important. And we'll be spending today talking about the Bible, Tanakh, this uh, term we use, Hebrew Bible, which actually was basically created for organizations like the Society for Biblical Literature to avoid the term Old Testament, which uh, doesn't really match Jewish understanding of the Bible. And so, uh, but for basically from a Jewish point of view, it's the Tanakh, the Bible. And we'll be discussing the aspects of what we can learn about it from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then we're going to be spending a session on what is can be learned about the history of Judaism and one about the uh, earliest stages of Christianity. Now, in doing so, I want to start out by introducing in a way. First of all, I think many of you heard Adolfo Reutemann. I am going to totally avoid telling the famous foundation myth of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We will not talk about the Bedouin boy or any of that other stuff, or the politics of difficulties of publication. We're not interested in any of those stories in this series. What we're interested here in is what we learn from the scrolls and why they're so important. Now, the first point I want to make about this is that for me, and this is, I, I will proudly say, this is one of the things that I have, I think, successfully convinced a lot of colleagues of. I want to say that the importance of the scrolls is not about a small group of sectarians that lived at Qumran on the shore of the Dead Sea, where we know the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Those people were people who couldn't hack it, you might say, in the general society and went off into the uh, desert to be able to live in a state of perfect holiness. But they collected a set of manuscripts, we could call it a library, which provide us information not only about them, but on others outside. Now, most scholars think that this group is the sect of the Essenes, known from Josephus and some other sources. I just remind you that the Essenes are not mentioned in the Talmud and they're not mentioned in the New Testament. So if this is really the name of the group, it's a very obscure group. I'm going to raise some questions and discuss with you that question of identification when we get to the second session. But what we do want to say for now is it's clearly a sectarian group that gathered these materials. And their library has three parts. Part number one, I'm talking about the contents of the manuscripts now. There are about, by, by the way, there are about 900 manuscripts and the three divisions are approximately equal. Let me just insert one point here. You'll be seeing some, some pictures here. You need to know that most of what we call manuscripts are just fragments of manuscripts, where we have five to 15% of what once was a manuscript. Now, our good friend Adolfo Reutemann is curator over the original scrolls that were found by the Bedouin, excuse me for mentioning him, in uh, 1947, and plus the temple scroll, which was later acquired by the Israel Museum through the Israeli government. Now, those materials look like scrolls, but everything else is small fragments of 5 to 10 percent, we assume, of what once upon a time was an entire scroll. So these scrolls, are about 900, come into three basic divisions. And these divisions are biblical material, which is most of what we're going to be speaking about today. And then we have what we call apocryphal material, which is books like the Bible or books that deal with biblical topics. But these works are not what we call sectarian in the field. That is to say they lack an animus against others, they lack a kind of polemical spirit, and they lack the ideology of the Dead Sea sectarians, the matter that we are mostly going to be talking about in our, in our next session. So the third type of text are the sectarians, which of course is just the reverse of what I say. They have invective against others, even hatred against outsiders. They have the ideology of the sectarian group and all kinds of other stuff like that. But we always have to, have to remem remember a key fact. It's what we call common Judaism. So it doesn't matter what sect you belonged in, it's still true that you celebrate Pesach, Passover. 
So we have to remember, as we're talking about these sectarian groups, that these are types of Jews living by the Torah, according to different interpretations of the Torah. So again, three basic types of manuscripts, manuscripts of Bible, manuscripts of apocryphal, or we'll call them Bible-like texts, the first two, non-sectarian. The third group, the sectarian materials. Usually when someone asks the poorly phrased question, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? They mean, who are the sectarians who gathered the library and wrote that segment or composed that segment? I don't like wrote, because wrote could mean copied. And we have to remember that many of the manuscripts come from diverse places in the land of Israel and date before the site of Qumran, where the manuscripts were found, were, was occupied in somewhere around 100 and and uh, 100 BCE. So many manuscripts that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls cannot have been copied there because the community that lived there didn't exist at that time. Now, just talking about dates, they say you're not supposed to talk about dates in a public lecture, but we have to do it. We have to remember that the earliest manuscripts are from circa 225, running up through more or less in terms of their having been copied, running up through a date of about 30 CE. Now the books go all the way back to the time of the Torah in terms of the date of composition, all the way up in composition to about the turn of the era. The library was gathered together and held at Qumran from about 100 BCE until about until 68 CE when the site was destroyed during the Roman operations. So at any rate, Right? That's a kind of basic outline of the stuff we're talking about. Now, we want to emphasize one last point before moving on, which is that we have to understand that we only have partial evidence for Second Temple Judaism. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have the books that are in the Catholic Bibles, that are in the Greek Bibles, which is how they got the Catholic Bible, called the Apocrypha. Here's a funny fact. Your Catholic neighbor has the books of Maccabees in his Bible, but Jews don't have it in their Bible because it's not part of the Bible because it was composed in the Hellenistic period. But anyhow, there are a lot of very interesting, there are 12 books in the Catholic Bibles that derive from the Latin Bibles, that derive from the Greek Bibles, sounds like Chad God Yah, right? Derived from the Greek Bibles, and all of these uh, materials, these 12 books, are Second Temple Jewish books. And then we have a whole bunch of information, a lot of information, in Josephus and in the Alexandrian Jewish author Philo, who lived around the turn of the era. So this stuff, plus the Dead Sea Scrolls, plus archaeology, plus Talmudic information about earlier periods, is how we build our understanding of Second Temple Judaism. And when we get all finished, we don't know everything. So you have to realize that the types of sources we have don't cover anywhere near what our modernist colleagues have when they want to do work on modern, modern history, and certainly the field of modern Jewish history. I happen to administratively supervise the project that's being done right now on the history of the Jews in the Soviet Union. And for this, now with the fall of the Soviet Union, we have so many materials in that field that you can't even use them all and in our field, in dealing with the Judaism of the Second Temple period, we're looking literally for any scrap, even a fragment that has a few words on it, and we'll be using it to try and gain our better understanding of Judaism in the period. Now, there we go. Okay. So, the, to understand the uh, discussion of biblical texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have to go back a bit to an earlier period when the scrolls were coming in. Now, remember, Israel, after actually previous to the founding of the state in 1948, had succeeded in buying three of the manuscripts. And then in 1950, Yigal Yadin, who was the son of Professor Sukenik, who first identified and dated the Dead Sea Scrolls, and of course the great Israeli archeologist was able to buy four more scrolls, so that all of the original scrolls ended up in Israel. Then, starting in the 1950s, there were further excavations and Bedouin discoveries in Jordan. 
these materials were gathered together in the Jordanian in main museum, what is today was called then the Palestine Archaeological Museum, now called the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem. And that collection of manuscripts began to be studied by an interconfessional Christian team of scholars. And the leading Bible scholar there was Frank Moore Cross from Harvard. And Frank Cross came up with a theory that was the reigning theory. And you have to understand that that theory claims that among the approximately 250 biblical manuscripts, of which virtually all of them were in the museum in Jordan that he was working on, these are the materials that are now in the possession of the Israel Antiquities Authority, okay? In the main collection in the Israel Museum has the great Isaiah scroll, which is an amazing scroll, but the rest of the biblical material, with the exception also, the, the, also the uh, Israel Museum also holds the Isaiah B scroll, and all the rest of the biblical materials are in the Antiquities Authority collection. Now, Frank Cross, based on that collection, when it was in Jordan before 1967, Israel conquered it in 1967, came up with the three family theory of biblical texts, which is what you'll find, even though it's outdated, in many, many books about the Dead Sea Scroll. This theory went as follows. It claimed that the Hebrew Bible existed originally in Second Temple times in three different what we call recensions. Now, a recension is like a version, but be careful about one thing. The differences we're talking about here are either grammatical forms or synonyms or a word here, a word there. It's not as if there was a different Torah. It's not as if there was a Bible that said, thou shalt steal or thou shalt commit adultery. The contents is all basically the same with no real differences. However, these, as we call them, recensions or versions, were understood to exist in three forms, what we call proto-Masoretic. Now, Cross claimed that that was the Babylonian version. Proto-Masoretic, the Masoretic text is the one that is used in any synagogue today. It's the Hebrew Bible text that was passed down by the rabbinic scholars of the Mishnah and Talmud that received its final editorial form in the hands of a group of scholars called the Masoretes from the Hebrew Misora. You know, the fiddler on the roof where they sing tradition, tradition. In Hebrew, it's Misora, Misora, and in Yiddish, it's Masaira, Masaira. So anyhow, it's the same word, Masoretic. It means the traditional text. And what the Masoretes did between the 6th and the ninth centuries of our era was to put the vowels and the cantillation marks and various other scholarly marks into the Bibles. However, that is the text that's used today. Then the second version, all these three versions are, in fact, in evidence. We're going to see why his theory needs to be modified. They are all in evidence in the Qumran scrolls. The second group of biblical texts, they call the proto maps from Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans are a group of the people who survived of the North Israelites when they were exiled in 722 BCE, mixed with, exile, with exiles of non-Jews who were brought into the land of Israel. Now, these people, over a long period of time, became quasi-Jews. They still exist in Israel in Cholon, and in Shechem, Nablus, where they have actually uh, an annual Paschal sacrifice there on Passover. At any rate, these Samaritans are a type of, uh, let's call them a sect of Jews in a certain sense, even though they, they say that they're the real Israel. But at any rate, their Bibles were based on a version which had a lot of what we call in scholarly terms harmonizations. Now, this may seem a funny thing, but I'll give you an example of what it means. It means that if you're reading a story in the book of Numbers and there's information about it in the book of, of Deuteronomy, you fill it in. So what happens in the harmonized Bible text is that things get repeated all over the Bible. So it's a kind of expansionary Bible. So that was the second type, which we find at Qumran. And the third type that we find at Qumran is what we call proto septuagintal because when
variations from the one that we're used to. And some of those variations are found in some Dead Sea Scrolls manuscripts. So based on this whole story, Kors put out the theory that there were three types of manuscripts. Now to complicate matters, you could look at this chart, which I wouldn't spend too much time on. But the point of it is that he cross-traced the complicated development over time of how there originally was the main original Bible, if we can understand such a thing, and then the original Bible bifurcated into Palestinian and Babylonian. But at some point, the Babylonian gave rise to a version that was known in Egypt and that was the basis for the Greek translation. Hence, when you get to the bottom of the chart, you can see that you have the Septuagint uh, type of Hebrew text, not the Greek, but the Hebrew that it was based on, a type of text that the Samaritan is based on, a type of text that the Masoretic is based on. And you think from this that there were three types of Bibles, like a person comes into the synagogue and there are three Bibles on the shelf and you could choose one of these Bibles or the second Bible or the third Bible. Now, the truth is that this whole theory has now had to be greatly, greatly revised. The first problem is the statistical problem. The truth is, and we'll see this in a few minutes, that the Proto-Samaritan and, and, the, the, and the version, which is Proto-Septuagint, like the one that was Septuagint was translated from, are actually available in very small numbers. And we're gonna see that in a few minutes. Then there's something else which scholars like to call vulgar text. Now, if I tell you a vulgar text, you think that someone must have written down some off-color jokes and some bad language, and that's a vulgar text. Well, that's not what it means. A vulgar text refers to the fact that there are a lot of texts of the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are written into a different dialect of Hebrew. Just imagine to yourself something that many of us have experienced in Jewish educational circles, where we translate the Bible from biblical Hebrew into modern Hebrew. That's one of the ways modern Hebrew is taught in many, many Jewish schools in our country. So at any rate, a vulgar text was a, a, a kind of rewriting of the Bible into a dialect of Hebrew that the Qumran sectarians used. Then there's the fact that many of the texts have a variety of types of texts in the same manuscript. I just put down here no New Testament found in the Quran just to make sure everybody knows that because the earliest New Testament book was probably written around the time, that's the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, right? Well, actually, that's not true what I just said because some of the epistles of Paul may be earlier than that. But at any rate, they're written when nobody's writing, composing any new text in Quran. And just even though it's not our subject today, right? Jesus and John the Baptist are not mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They weren't born when the texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls were composed, and there's, we don't see any impact of them on the Dead Sea Scrolls, despite various television programs that they, you may watch, on some of which they may call on people like me after building up a bunch of hype of baloney about uh, the relevance to uh, early Christianity, they will then ask someone like me to explain why it's wrong. So I throw that in right now just to make it clear, no New Testament was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, Let's take a look at the statistics, which will sort of expose what the problem is here. That the Proto-Masoretic is the largest group, the one, in other words, which is like the Torah in your synagogue. And the non-aligned is a very, very big group of the texts, whether we speak about the Torah or the, the writings. Non-aligned means it's like none of the above because it's all of the above in one manuscript because there's no such consistency because the big thing that we learn from these Bible texts is that the consistency that we are used to as a result of the assumption of biblical authority is present more or less in the ones that are called proto-Masoretic that are the ones that are eventually going to lead up to the traditional texts accepted by the medieval Jewish community but the, there are all kinds of texts that have the so-called non-aligned or mixed text. And let's just remember again that the ones that look like the texts of the Samaritans or look like the texts that are the basis of the Septuagint are very small numbers. And therefore, the theory that we had before of three texts was grossly, grossly oversimplified. Now, you may ask the following question. Why should I, in giving a lecture to the general public, want to tell you about the theory that is no longer true. 
And the reason that I have to tell you that is because you'll find it in so many books and many biblical scholars have not yet heard that 20 years ago or so, when the full collection of Dead Sea Scrolls was opened up in 1991, we discovered that Frank Cross's theory, as if there were three equal groups of scrolls, was way exaggerated, and it did not take into consideration a very large group of texts that we are terming non-aligned. I, I realize I just repeated myself on purpose to make sure everybody is going to remember this, this one. Whatever you know, you'll remember this. Now, we also need to mention a very important point that we have two other collections, what I like to call the other Dead Sea Scrolls. These are the manuscripts from Masada and from the caves where people fled during the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 5. Remember, Masada was destroyed in 73, 73 or 4, there are some people hold uh, CE, as right after the destruction of the temple in 70 by the Romans. Here we have biblical manuscripts, not the same number, nowhere near as many, but the manuscripts we have are all proto-Masoretic, which shows us one of two things. Either that this mixture of manuscripts that we see at Qumran is to some extent typical of a sectarian group and not of some other Jews, or possibly that we're in a period in which the variegation of biblical texts when it comes to some small details in them, the variegation is giving away is giving way to a complete unification. And that unification of our Bible, the one we have today, minus the vowels and minus the, uh, the, the cantillation marks, basically is the Bible, which is going to continue on into the Middle Age. What, whatever else, whichever explanation one takes, it's certainly true that Masada and Bokokhba caves have only the one, which is the forerunner of the one which we have today, I say forerunner because the vowels and cantillation marks, of course, were added in the earlier, the early Middle Ages or end of late antiquity, however you want to take it. Now I want to take a look at some examples, actual examples. This is a manuscript of the book of Leviticus by Yikra, which is written in the old Hebrew script. Some of the texts are written in what's like the Canaanite type Phoenician script, which started to be used by at least some sectarians, maybe, we're not 100% sure by whom, as a revival, a kind of archaizing revival during the period after the Maccabean revolt. Now, we have to remember that the period of the heyday of the Qumran sect is after the Maccabean revolt and the establishment of the Hasmonean kingdom. The Hasmonean kingdom lasted from 152 BCE to 63 BCE when the Romans conquered the country. That's not the destruction. That's when the Romans conquered the country. Then in between, we have various procurators. We have the Herodian dynasty. And then we eventually get up to the period of 66 to 73 CE, which is the Jewish revolt against Rome that leads to the destruction of the temple and destruction of Masada. But at any rate, there was a revival of the old script after the Maccabean revolt. And that you see here. This manuscript has another feature, which is very important. I think you can see my cursor. And you'll notice that at the end of the manuscript, there are these little tongues that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the bottom was destroyed by rotting either on a cave floor or in a jar. We don't know for this particular manuscript. It was, but what we do know is that this results from the fact that if you wind up a scroll, the end of the scroll is going to be have a smaller circumference to its coils than the beginning. And this is the beginning. And you see the wider circumference to the coils. You can see it when you look at the destruction pattern. This is a very important thing because the pattern of destruction is used by scholars to reconstruct some of the very fragmentary manuscripts that we have. And so it's very, it's very helpful. This manuscript is virtually letter for letter the same as our manuscripts of our book of, of Vayikra, of Leviticus, in a Bible. The one thing I'll point out to you is that in general terms, the Talmud stated that we cannot, we meaning they, cannot be certain about the vowel letters, Vav and Yud, O and E, in Hebrew, because various manuscripts have inconsistencies in the writing of these vowel letters. That will certainly be the case in any Dead Sea Scroll Bible manuscript, no question. This is another very interesting manuscript because this is a manuscript also written 
You can see it on your screen if you put your face close enough to the screen, which is what I did to make sure I'm telling you something correct, right? This manuscript is called Exodus M. And this manuscript, which comes from K4 in Quran, has a, uh, is, is in the old script. But this manuscript is not exactly the same as ours. It's a manuscript that has some variants that are the same as variants found in the Greek Septuagint Bible. So this again shows us that some of the differences in those Greek Bibles result from translation from Hebrew manuscripts that are a little bit different from our manuscript. Now here we talk about difference. This is a manuscript called Numbers and Numbers uh, N, N, N. Now, this manuscript has a very interesting feature about it. The person who copied this manuscript put big interpretive additions in. In fact, there's a very big problem as to where do we draw the line between a Bible and an expanded type Bible. What do I mean by this? That we have an idea that the Bible can't be messed with. This is actually a Talmudic idea. The rabbis of the Mishnah and Talmud believe that you have to keep man's idea, humans, humanity's idea, whatever we want to call it, separate from God's. As a result, it was considered forbidden to mess with the text, to put in interpretations, but they had to be kept outside in the oral tradition. But that is not the case with at least the scribe of this and many similar manuscripts. This scribe decided to make additions to make the Bible better understood. These additions come from basically one of two places, from manuscripts that are similar to things that we find in the Greek Bibles, because sometimes these editions are shared with the Greek Bible. Not that he copied out of a Greek Bible, but they had a Hebrew Bible, apparently, that looked that way. It had those same variants. Or, in some cases, he schlepped in stuff from the book of Deuteronomy, which repeats the story of the Torah to explain some of the stories in Numbers. And also, you can sort of see the aesthetic beauty of some of this fragmentary material, but you can also imagine what scholars go to, the efforts they go to, to try and piece it together and try to determine what might have been in the broken pieces, what we call restoration. Now, this particular manuscript is really very far from the simple text, and it might be that we should even consider it an interpretive or expanded Bible text rather than a real Bible. This you probably saw if you had the lecture from Professor Reutemann. This is the crown jewel of his museum. This is the Isaiah A manuscript, which covers the entire book of Isaiah. Now, this gives you a sense of how much these manuscripts looked like our Torahs externally. The scribal traditions are very much the same. Notice that the letters hang from lines, which is the way Jewish Bible manuscripts supposed to be written. The lines, you don't write on the line, the letters hang from the line. And then you should notice the intercolumn the margins between the columns. And these margins are also the same way as you would see in a modern Torah. And then the stitches, which are actually a little bit different from a modern Torah. But anyhow, then you have the margin on the top has to be smaller than the margin on the bottom. But I messed this up because I photographed it so you can't see the bottom margin but the bottom margin is in fact bigger as would be in a, in a Torah scroll. So you can see that the scribal traditions of the way Bible is handed down and passed down, much of that is, is quite similar. Uh, of course, as you look at the lettering of our Torah scrolls over the years between a combination of aesthetic considerations and Jewish law considerations, the letters have become fancier and more beautiful in many ways. So there's a certain different aesthetic that would hit you when you see a modern Torah. But nonetheless, you can see that uh, the, so much of it is very, very similar. Uh, this manuscript of Isaiah is in a completely different Hebrew dialect than the original Isaiah. There is another Isaiah. This is called Isaiah A. Isaiah B which was also one of the early manuscripts acquired by Israel. And Isaiah B, which for some reason doesn't get exhibited, Isaiah B is written in regular dialect of biblical Hebrew and is a proto-Masoretic text, which has most of the book of Isaiah. And it is written exactly, well, I shouldn't say exactly, almost exactly the same as ours. Now, people ask this question very often. I get this following question. 
people have heard that there are two possible different stories. One story they heard is the Dead Sea Scrolls proved, proved that the Bible is exactly the same as our Bible. And then the next group says, no, the Dead Sea Scrolls have thousands and thousands of variants. Well, if you write a biblical book into another dialect of Hebrew, right there in the one book, you're going to have to have 500 variants. And so the truth is, as here I have to quote our colleague Eugene Ulrich, he always says, he says, the good news is our Bible is their Bible. The bad news is that some of their Bible texts had variations from ours. But it's not a simple question. It's all the same. It's not all the same. These are all simplistic questions and really not the right question because what we're trying to learn is the nature of the biblical text, what it was like in the Second Temple times, specifically from about 200 BCE to about, let's say, close 70 CE. And we want to know what was that like before the rabbis successfully made the decision that the one we now call the Proto-Masoretic was the Bible, and it remained the Bible of the Jewish people. And that process is what we want to understand by studying biblical materials on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this is an example from Masada, which I show you, first of all, because it follows the Masoretic text virtually exactly. And not only that, and this is a very important point, that it shows you again that the story of the manuscript from antiquity of the Bible, which basically starts at Qumran, continues to Masada and the Bar Kokhba caves, and we're able to see that by the time we get to that period, right, the period after destruction of the temple, and, and certainly that the Bible, the Jews have basically adopted as a standard the one that we call the Masoretic or Proto-Masoretic form. Now, here just is a piece of Daniel. If anybody offers to sell you a piece of Daniel, do not buy it because there is a piece that was stolen. But I have to tell you also, if anyone offers you a Dead Sea Scroll fragment, do not buy it because there are people who have spent millions on what now turn out to be forged materials because somebody forged, at least we know about close to 75 fragments and made a lot of money on them. And we don't want to uh, join that group of people who unfortunately lost fortune. But Daniel is a very special book among the Dead Sea Scrolls because there's a lot of debate about when to date it. But some scholars date parts of Daniel as late as the Maccabean Revolt of 168 to 164. Whatever the date of 168 to 164 BC, whatever the date of Daniel is, Daniel is the biblical book that is closest in date to the Dead Sea Scrolls, people who used and copied these manuscripts of any biblical book. And it is, of course, a book written, most of it, most of it in Aramaic. So it, it's, it's quite interesting to see the continuity right from the biblical period right into the period of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, Daniel is a great example of that. Now, we want to talk a little bit now about the question of the history of the biblical collection, because there is a major debate, as you can see already here, you know, people think there's some kind of what they call a consensus about the Dead Sea Scroll. There is. There's a consensus among real scholars about what the dating is, the significance, but there's a lot of stuff that we disagree with. And in fact, we have like a very nice group of people who are all friendly. So it's nice to see these disagreements go on. And it's a good example maybe in our society today for our political leaders. Uh, they're not going to obviously tune in to any of our stuff, but but if they did, they would learn that it's possible to have very, very big debates and be friends and work together on projects. So at any rate, one of the big debates is, is there a closed or open canon? Or is there any canon? Now, let's define canon. A canon refers, in our case here, to the collection of those books that are regarded as the authority, authoritative books of what we today call a Bible. Now, before I go on with this discussion, I must admit to you that I'm in a minority. I'm, of course, correct, but I am in a minority. I believe that there was a canon at Qumran, but many of my colleagues don't. I'll tell you a little bit why I do believe that, but I'm also going to represent their arguments to you. Because, uh, first of all, because that's only fair and honest. And uh, second of all, because let's just say I vacillate between knowing I'm 100% right but I have once in a while made a mistake. So what can I do? I have to somehow or another, and I, I don't want to mislead anybody. So let me explain the positions here. The 
people who say there is no canon, what they think is that nobody has really decided in the Dead Sea Scrolls collection that a biblical book is any more authoritative or any different from a lot of other books that are found there. And that this idea of defining these books as a particular core group is not, is not valid. Now, the funny part is when you ask them to discuss what are the groups of texts, they'll refer to those that we later call the Bible. Okay. Now, the open canon claims that there are authoritative books, but no one decided that they can't be any more added. Whereas the closed canon says they had a list. It might not be our list, but they had a list of what are, in their opinion, divinely inspired books. That third position is mine. Now, let's first of all mention that the book of Esther is the only book in our Bible that is not found in the Dead Sea Scroll. This is a semi-fishy statement because it's on the assumption that Ezra and Nehemiah are one book. Now, I want to make an appeal here for people to read all the books of the Bible because most people, and certainly in the Jewish community, have never read Ezra and Nehemiah. They haven't read Daniel. And they certainly haven't read Chronicles. Now, Chronicles has nine chapters at the beginning of name lists. So you can see why an average reader won't want to read. But I would just say to you, if you haven't read the Bible, read it. I used to tell students that if you're ashamed to be seen reading the Bible, get one of those covers that people use, those plastic covers, with people who read off-color books in the subway. But now I don't have to tell them that because the Bible's available on your phone. So you don't even have to spend any money to read the Bible. You just need to find a, a good Bible translation on your phone and read it. Why do I say this? Because actually, I want to tell you that Ezra and Nehemiah really historically was one book, but Nehemiah is not, does not exist except in a forged fragment. Now, the get back where we are here. So if we take away Esther, which doesn't exist and may not have been in their Bible, they seem to have all of our books, and now I'm representing my point of view, and the only books called a sefer, the word book in the Dead Sea Scrolls, are our biblical books with one possible exception. Furthermore, I argue that the only books that are used to generate other books are the ones we call the Bible. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Anyone who has used, recited traditional High Holy Day prayers will be used to the fact, although maybe you might not realize it, that they're all made up of reused biblical expressions. And the reuse of material to create later use is a sign that something is considered to be scripture. Finally, there is a work that we call 4QMMT. And that work is a very key sectarian document that we will be talking about a lot in the next session. And that has the tripartite Jewish canon of the Torah, the right, the prophets, and the writings, which is from where we get the Jewish name for the Bible, Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, right? Torah, prophets, writings. Now, I have to tell you that my good friend Gene Ulrich doesn't agree with this, so I, I can't tell you it's 100% correct, but I think it is. Now, there is evidence that in the canon of the Dead Sea Scroll sectarians, there are two other books. The Book of Jubilees, which is a book I'm sure no one here, well, maybe someone has heard of, I shouldn't say that, and the Aramaic Levi document. Now, the Book of Jubilees is a retelling of Genesis, basically into, into Exodus up till the time of the Exodus from Egypt. It's a retelling of that, going by a chronology of Jubilee years, 50-year cycles, claiming that the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, observed all the commandments. And the Aramaic Levi document has nothing to do with the dungarees or jeans, whatever you call them now, but the Aramaic Levi document, that was, I know that's a bad joke, don't worry about it. Right? Bad jokes work with students in the classroom, but they have to laugh, but they don't, they don't necessarily work here because if you, even if you tell a good joke, you can't hear anybody laughing because they're muted. So it doesn't pay to tell any jokes. But at any rate, the Aramaic uh, Levi document is a document which talks about the priesthood of Levi, the son of Jacob, and has in it some very interesting laws of sacrifice. These documents may have been considered by them to be part of their Bible. 
Now we have to note that in both Talmudic literature and in the New Testament, the Hebrew Bible canon is very stable. And it's not some open one, it's ours. Let me explain this, however, in a bit more detail. Only the 24 books of our Hebrew Bible, Jewish Bible, Tanakh, or what the Christians call the Old Testament, are quoted by the Talmudic rabbis, with the exception of one book, the book of Ben Sirah, also known as Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, which is Hebrew Kohelet. This book of Ben Sirah, also, by the way, known in the Eastern churches as Sirach, this book is a beautiful wisdom book from a scribe written in about 180 BCE, and some small parts of it were found at Qumran, but at Masada, a big manuscript for the second half of the book was found. And then the other right exception on the New Testament side, they only quote our regular Hebrew Bible books, what they call the Old Testament in the New, except that the book of Jude quotes a work called Enoch. Enoch in Hebrew is Hanoch, right? They quote that work. So there are little exceptions around the side, but basically the New Testament and the rabbis only have our same 24 books that are the books of the Jewish Bible and of the Christian Old Testament. That being the case, the argument that earlier there was no specific collection, in my mind, is way overstated. Now, this is the work of MMT that we'll be coming back to. In fact, I should excuse myself because I may show you this slide again. Most of you will not see. And here you see the words, we have written to you in order that you should understand the book of Moses, the Torah, the works of the prophets, and David, and the Chronicles. These are the three parts of the Bible. Because you have Moses, the Torah, you got the prophets, and what do we call David? That's the Psalms and Chronicles of each and every generation. And Ezra and Nehemiah is also historical. And I admit they didn't mention the five scrolls. And remember, they don't have Esther. By the way, Purim is not in their calendar. So they may have opposed post-biblical or late biblical holidays. Okay, now, they also have, besides biblical books, they have some of those books that are found in the Christian Apocrypha. And this is a piece of Tobit, and it's a piece of, uh, of papyrus. There were two Aramaic manuscripts of Tobit, and interestingly, one Hebrew translation. There must have been some people who had trouble reading, uh, reading, reading Hebrew. Now, in Cave 7 in Qumran, there are some Greek fragments that may be fragments of a Greek translation of the Bible. That I probably should add to this lecture, because I realize now that it's not here. Now, I mentioned before that the book of Jude had in it a quotation. The book of Jude is only one chapter. I won't ask if anybody knows what the one book in the Hebrew Bible, which is one chapter, is, but that's Obadiah, Obadiah. And that, but there's one book in the New Testament, one chapter is Jude, and Jude has in it a quotation of Enoch. Now, Enoch is a very interesting story. Enoch and Jubilees have a similar story. They were known to us in complete form in Semitic Ethiopic, called Gez, passed on by Ethiopic Jews and or Christians. And that is to say, these are the people, of course, the Ethiopian Jews, many of whom now live in Israel. At any rate, of these works, right, Enoch and Jubilees, we had, Jubilees was apparently written in Hebrew, <clears throat> Enoch originally in Aramaic. Now, they were known to us in Ethiopic translation and in Greek fragments. However, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls collection yielded manuscripts of Enoch, partial manuscripts, in Aramaic. And there's a whole very, very uh, big already industry of scholarship on this. We actually had 80 scholars or something like that online for four days discussing Enoch at a recent conference. I was a commentator, and when I agreed to be a commentator, I didn't realize the disadvantage. It meant, A, my face was going to be shown through the entire conference at all sessions, which B meant I couldn't eat during the sessions, and I certainly had to make sure not to fall asleep. 
So I and three other people were the only ones who had no vacation during that conference. We were constantly on display, but it was a great conference of great scholarship in which the main subject of the conference was the question of evil and what evil is caused by. But Enoch is a work that was virtually unknown in the Jewish community. Of course, the Bible says about Enoch, Hanoch, that uh, he was not because he was taken up by God. And if somebody's taken up to heaven by God, there must be a lot to talk about. That's in Genesis 5. And so all books were written about him and all kinds of midrash was written about him. But at any rate, some sectarians and some Christians may have considered this even to be a biblical book. Now I want to show you some materials that are on the edge between being Bible and not being Bible. So this is what they call the oldest Ten Commandments. In the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit in New York, in Times Square, it, they brought this manuscript between Christmas and New Year's. It took an hour and a half line to get into the exhibit and an hour and a half line to see this manuscript. Now this manuscript is quite amazing for the following reason. It's not really a manuscript of Deuteronomy. The beginning is Deuteronomy 8, then comes Deuteronomy 5. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, the Lord your God, I skipped some, of course, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day to sanctify it. And then it suddenly it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Now, I'm sure that everybody here is completely familiar with the fact that there are two Ten Commandments in the Torah, one in Exodus and one in Deuteronomy. And everybody knows that the one in Exodus says that you keep Shabbat because God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. And therefore, by keeping the Sabbath, one affirms that God is the creator. And everybody knows that in Deuteronomy, it says that you keep the Sabbath because you were slaves and you have to give a day of rest to your servants, to your animals even, and that it's forbidden to make people work more than six days without a day of rest. Now, what this manuscript did is to take the two and put them together. Now, if you read over the Friday night Kiddush, you will see that on the Friday night Kiddush in the second paragraph, after reciting the paragraph that says that the heaven and earth were finished and God created the earth, you then go on to do the benediction on wine and then the benediction on the Sabbath. And guess what? It says two reasons to keep the Sabbath as a remembrance of the creation and a remembrance of the fact that one has to have a day of rest and give a day of rest. So the bottom line here is that you have an idea in Judaism that's quite common, and that uh, there are many other midrashic and other mentions of the same idea, and you see that somebody actually messed around, if we use that word, with a biblical text in order to get across this motif. Now, again, if you would go to some rabbi of the Talmud and say, I want to get a scribe, and I want to write a biblical text that looks like a biblical text where I mix up the Bible, they'd go through the floor and say, you have no right to do that. Your commentary belongs on the side. We in the skulls field call this rewritten Bible. And there's a lot of rewritten Bible, some of which is going to come up next time. Now, this is another interesting example of the border. This is a manuscript of the Book of Psalms. Now, actually, it's much longer than this. This is a, a rather large manuscript count found in Cave 11 in Qumran. Cave 11 yielded a lot of large manuscripts, as did Cave 1. Cave 4 yielded most of the broken pieces, and then a variety of other caves between, basically between 2 and, and, and 10, yielded broken pieces. But you'll notice, first of all, that this was lying on the ground, hence the damage on the bottom. Sadly, we lost all the bottom letters, bottom rows. However, this text mixes, mixes biblical and non-biblical praises of God. And then it has what we call a colophon, a kind of statement about what's in it, which says that these are just some of the psalms, enormous numbers of psalms written by David, and talks about various holidays. There is a beautiful, beautiful poem in here about Jerusalem. And one of the more interesting things in here is that it has 100, Psalm 145, which is generally known in the Jewish community as Ashrei, even though Ashrei comes from the previous psalm, but beginning with the, the words, Tehillah David, a praise to David, it's Psalm 145. But Psalm 145, as we have it, is missing a verse for Nun, the Hebrew letter Nun, which is like N. And this manuscript has one. 
Some scholars think it's the original, some scholars don't think, but let me tell you something even better, at least in my opinion, it depends on what, I guess, what your opinion is. There is a line in this manuscript between every verse of this psalm, blessed is he and his name, right, forever and ever, which indicates to me that that same psalm recited in the synagogues today was a liturgical psalm for the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarians or whoever copied this manuscript. Now there's a debate whether this is a biblical manuscript with additional poems, or they had a book of psalms that was open. But I can tell you one thing without any question. The psalms manuscripts in Qumran don't yet have a stable order for the psalms. That is, even those manuscripts that have nothing additional in them, which is a majority of them, they don't have a stable order. And that shows us that the collection of material had not become totally stabilized. Again, once we get to the Psalms manuscripts, their Psalms manuscripts in Masada, we see that it's totally, totally, totally stable. And, and that's that same process. Now, here's what the Psalm, what it says about David in this text. The Lord gave him a spirit of wisdom and enlightened, and it follows a description there of 4,050 compositions, and that he spoke through prophecy. Well, of course, we don't have, in the book of Psalms, there are 150 chapters, and there are a few extra psalms in the Septuagint version of psalms, and the Syriac Aramaic Christian church has a few more, but by and large, we don't have these things. They probably never existed, and it's probably a claim that some of the beautiful apocryphal compositions, non-biblical, that are in this psalm scroll were composed by uh, King David, which of course is a claim that we shouldn't take literally. I also should have pointed out, I don't think you can see it in the slide, no, that the, the, God, the names of God in this text are written in the old script. These sectarians thought that writing the name of God in the old Canaanite script was a way of making a scroll more holy. The rabbis thought that this was a way of making it unholy. They actually prohibited that. So if you would order a Torah scroll today and try to do that, you'd be making a big mistake because the synagogue wouldn't use it. Now, we want to now get to the second part of our lecture, which is what are the different kinds of interpretation? Now, I've listed the kinds of interpretation here running from those closest to just telling you what the Bible says. Translation, Targum, which is in Aramaic, and the Septuagint, which is in Greek. And then going towards the more and more expansive. So you have the simple sense commentary. That's like you find, again, you open up a Bible in a synagogue, commentary in the bottom, they want you to know what the Torah is talking about. Then retelling of the Bible. And that's where the rabbis objected to people messing with the text. But many of the contents of this material is like the rabbis Agadah, their legendary type storytelling and expansion of the Bible. Then we have the idea of, of harmonization, which can either be a textual harmonization where it's simply someone taking from elsewhere in the Bible from another expression or another sentence and adding material to, by harmonization, we mean making part A like part B and part B like part A. So if I copy from Deuteronomy to Exodus and from Exodus to Deuteronomy, that's all harmonization. It's like making it all the same. And halachic Jewish law arguments, uh, the rabbis did not like anyone messing around the text, as we said. But I will point out that there is a parallel between some of this interpretation with the Karaite sect that came into being in the 8th century, the literalist Jews who rejected the rabbinic tradition, and the way in which they understood much of the biblical tradition. So now that's a very quick outline that we're going to actually see examples, and that will take us through our time here. So uh, I'm going to try and go a little bit quickly, though. So this is just an example of the Targum, the Aramaic translation of Job. We only have Aramaic translation in the scrolls for Job, which is the hardest Hebrew in the Bible, and we have a little scrap for Leviticus. That little scrap is important for one reason. It tells us that the sectarians defined the word kaporet as the cover of the ark. Christians later defined it as mercy seat, whatever that is, and it's interesting to see that the text from Qumran defines it as did later Judaism. Now, when it comes to simple trans, simple brain sense interpretation, so here is an example from this Genesis commentary to show you what we mean by that. 
So there is a big question. Why did Noah, after he was exposed in his tent, and after his children came in and covered him up, and there are many interpretations of all kinds about what really happened there. Leaving that aside, why does the Bible say that Noah cursed his grandson? So he says, Noah did not curse, curse Ham, but rather he cursed Ham's son, Canaan. Why? Answer, for God had blessed the sons of Noah. Noah knew that it wouldn't help to curse the guy who did it, so he cursed that guy's son. Now, we, I don't care whether this is a right interpretation or a wrong interpretation. We like it, we don't like it. What I want you to understand here is there are interpretations to simple questions of why does the Bible say what it says? Or in another case, we have this story, right, which about uh, Ruvain, right, which sounds like he had relations with Bilhah, the concubine of his father. So here we have an interpretation that says that he, Jacob, reproved Reuben because he had sexual relations with Bilah, his concubine. Now, the Bible doesn't say that explicitly. It doesn't say it at all explicitly. In fact, there is a space in the middle of the verse in our Bibles where the Torah reader pauses and then goes on, and it doesn't say what happened. And here you see a text just filling you in on what is the Bible talking about. So that's simple type commentary. Then we have this unbelievable text called the Genesis Apocryphon, which shows us about how, and this is an Aramaic text, the Bible stories are often expanded in a way similar to the Midrash. Now, one of the biggest questions that everybody has is, why should Abraham lie about his wife, Sarah, and claim that she was his sister? So the answer the text gives is that Abraham had a dream and he understood this dream, and you can read this text yourself, he understood this dream to mean that God had commanded him to not tell the truth about her and to hide her. Now, the rabbis have another approach to this. They say that Abraham was afraid she was so beautiful that he put her in a box, and he went in, and he was traveling with her in a box so that they wouldn't be able to see the beautiful Sarah. But unfortunately, someone spotted her in the hotel room. Well, at any rate, whatever was going on over here, this gives a different interpretation. This gives the interpretation that Sarah has to say, we're going to lie, and we're going to say, Abraham says to Sarah, we're going to lie, we're going to say you're my sister, because it will protect me from being killed. But the bottom line is, it blames it on God. And the question that we have, why should he do this? And eventually it doesn't work, right? He blames it on God. Okay. Now we want to talk about this idea of halachic midrash, and its relation to rabbinic literature. So to understand this, you have to know that there are two kinds of understanding of the, the Torah in the, de, in the scroll. There is nigla, which means what anyone can read, and the hidden law, which is the sectarian law. And this is very much like the rabbinic concept of written and oral law. One other kind of interpretation that we'll see an example of is Pesher. And Pesher is a type of interpretation in which the prophets are interpreted as if they're talking about the sect's own time. So we want to see some examples of these phenomena of interpretation. So here is a case where you can understand what they're saying to us in terms of the way in which there is a revealed interpretation that has been given, which is only given to the sect. This is the rule of the community, which is one of the sectarian texts. This is the interpretation of the Torah, which he, God, commanded through Moses to observe, according to everything revealed from time to time, and as the prophets have revealed by his Holy Spirit, which makes the point that the revealed law, the Torah, has to be explained in different circumstances and in different times. Now, this led to the existence of texts like the Temple Scroll. Now, I have to tell you that I am partial to this document, which we will talk about probably next time somewhat. And I, with a colleague, just finished a new commentary, a new, actually, edition commentary of all the manuscripts. It's with the publisher right now. It's one of those books that probably will only be sold digitally now because nobody wants books anymore. But it's a, it will be a very obscure work for scholars. But at any rate, we are tremendously happy to have finished it. This is a 66-column adaptation and rewrite of the Torah, 
in order to express many laws. Now, here is an example of the way this text works. You know that the new year, Rosh Hashanah, coming up on the Jewish calendar, is really in the seventh month. Now, you can ask the question, even though we know it's a great time for school starts in September, why did anybody ever think the idea of the new year in the seventh month? So actually, if you look at the Torah, the Torah says that the real new year is the first of the first month. The first month is Nisan, the one of, Pass of Passover. So anyhow, the sectarian group, whoever wrote this temple scroll, wanted to do a new year on what we'll call 1-1, the first of the first month, which means 15 days before Passover. They wanted to do a new year. So how do you know what to sacrifice? Simple. Go to the Torah. The Torah says what to sacrifice on the first day of the seventh, or Rosh Hashanah, and import it, harmonize it, and put it here. On the first of this month, there shall be beginning of the months. That's taken from Exodus 12. This shall be you the first of the month, still in Exodus 12. Then you may not do any labor. You may not prepare it. You should prepare a he goat, and you should do this, and you should do that. That all comes from the Torah's command for the new year on the seventh month, which is our Rosh Hashanah. Imported by this scroll, this is harmonization, to the first month. And that's the type of interpretation that they use to make a lot of new holidays. If you like taking off, you want to be a member of the Dead Sea sect, because they had a lot of extra holidays. Now, there is a work which is called the Fragments of the Tzadokite Work. I think we have to start watching the time, right? Yeah. Uh, we have a, uh, it's called the Fragments of the Tzadokite Work. And this was the first Dead Sea Scroll really discovered in the Cairo Geniza in the late 18, in the 1890s. But it turned up to be in the Dead Sea Scrolls that turned up to be 10 manuscripts. Anyhow, this has very complicated Jewish law interpretations, such as the ones that you learn about in the Talmud. As to that, what he said, God said, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your kinfolk. Okay, not allowed to have a grudge. Anybody from among those who entered the covenant, the sect, who shall bring a charge against his neighbor, which is not with reproof. Now let me explain what's going on here, and you can read ahead. The Bible commands, you shall surely reprove your neighbor. We think that means, as the Talmud puts it, if you can get your neighbor to listen to you and he's doing something wrong, you put your arm around him and you say, listen, my friend, really, I feel funny advising you about this. not really my business. I have to tell you the truth, right? It really, you have to be a little careful the way you're talking to your son. It didn't sound good in public or whatever it might be, right? So hopefully it's nothing worse than that. And what happens here is they tell you that it's really a forensic process. Reproof must be done before a person can be taken to court for having violated something. And if you don't do it, you're a grudge bearer. He, God, takes vengeance on his adversaries and bears a grudge but only God. And if a person kept still from day to day and then accused somebody without having reproved him in advance for committing the same transgression, he violates the requirement of reproof. Now you see what's happening here. One verse interpreted in light of another verse, interpreted in light of a third verse. This is very similar to the Talmud, even though this is a sectarian group that rejects many of the principles of the Talmudic rabbis. Now, finally, we have to talk about Pesher, and this is the last thing we have to do. Pesher is a type of interpretation that explains the prophets as if they are happening in our time. Some of them are continuous, verse by verse. Some of them are anthologies of interpretations, and sometimes a Pesher interpretation is embedded in other work. Now, there's a theology behind this, because the theology says that the prophets who spoke in ancient times didn't really understand what they were talking about. And until the teacher of righteousness, the leader of the sect, interprets the words of the prophet, then we don't know what it means. Now, this type of prophecy is found in the New Testament in what we call the fulfillment passages, where the text will say, this comes to fulfill what it says in the prophet so-and-so. That's very similar, because they're acting as if Jesus's life is foretold in a prophecy it's really talking about the 8th century BCE. In rabbinic literature, the rabbis were against this. As far as the rabbis are concerned, what you do is you understand a prophet in its own context, 
and then you see how it's relevant for you. So if Amos is saying that people are cheating and mistreating the poor, it doesn't mean that Amos is talking about someone today doing it. He's talking about someone in the 8th century BCE. But I should learn from it not to do it today. You see the difference? The sectarians will say, no, it's talking about today, literally. And no one understood it until the teacher of righteousness told us that. Here you see a patient text. Please notice the old Hebrew script. Okay. Now, here's your one, one example that we'll see. They did not believe when they heard all that was happening to the last generation from the mouth of the priest. In his heart, God had put knowledge. What you see here is that the priest who is the teacher of righteousness has to be the one who explains. And they quote here the book of Habakkuk to tell you that only when the teacher explains the prophecy correctly, as it applies to today, it are the words of the ancient biblical prophet correctly understood. Here is the Pesha on the book of Nahum. One of my students wrote a 600-page book on this piece right here. And we're now going to conclude by saying that there's no question that already in the scrolls we have a concept of religious authority of Scripture. It's quite clear that Scripture can motivate and can be a part of the authority system that Jews are living with. Also, Judaism is divine human partnership in its own self-understanding. It understands that God gave certain books and God inspired certain prophets, but humans have to interpret and apply those to life. Finally, biblical interpretation is itself an important aspect of sectarian formation. All the different groups of Jews, and we see it right here with the Qumran sectarians, each one has its own understanding of the Bible. Interpretation or exegesis, that's a fancy word for interpretation, is a mode of change and development for Judaism. And that is a phenomenon we're going to be seeing more in our next session. And finally, there is no question that the Dead Sea Scrolls are a legacy, which are going to help us, and we're going to see this in our next two sessions, to understand be better the development of Judaism and Christianity. So thank you very much, and I guess we'll take questions. Can you, uh, can you unshare it? Would you mind unsharing the screen? Sure. Ah, thank you. So that was a lot of material. After our program with Adolfo, people asked for, deep, for a deep you dive. You got it, you got it. You got the deep dive, everybody. And then I think we went, uh, we went from a snorkel down to uh, the bottom of uh, what's the lowest point you can dive into there in the last uh, 20 minutes. So uh, people had put notes in saying, oh my God, what just happened? There was so much material in the last 15 minutes. They're gonna have to listen to this again. So the good news is I have recorded. I will send it to you. You can put it, you can listen to it and um, take it apart, understand it. There was a lot in there and I'll let people start asking questions, but I will ask first by saying, people really wanna spend time on the, on the pieces that you just mentioned. Is there a particular book or an online resource where they can A, read the original documents or B, go through some of the stuff that you've just mentioned in their, in, in their time and read and understand? Okay, so let's answer this quickly. First of all, because of the uh, realities of the commercial and market, etc., the only people who can read the scrolls online are people who read manuscript fragments. They're all available online for our research. If you want to read the scrolls, the biblical scrolls are, you would want to get, the closest thing you're going to get if you want to see information about the biblical scrolls is something called the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, edited by Eugene Ulrich. However, I think you may want to be more interested in the non-biblical scrolls, because you can't really appreciate the issues of the biblical text unless you're studying them in Hebrew. But the non-biblical scrolls, you're safe with the translation of Vermeish. That's a pretty safe translation. And then there, is, uh, there are a number of other translations. Actually, the truth be told, the translations that are on the market are all fine on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you would have no problem. I believe that the Vermeish translation, V-E-R-M-E-S, is uh, someone seems to put the whole thing online. Whether it's legal or not, I can't answer. Now, if you want to read about the things that we're talking about here, I'm going to, I would recommend you get my book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, or you get, when you're gonna, we're going to send you this, I think, so I don't know if we need to really go through this, but Vanderkam and Flint, right, as a, a, a good survey on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, if you have the opportunity to get in 
to uh, the type of library, university library, you can go to the Encyclopedia of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which has enormous amounts of material on all these topics. But uh, unless you want to buy that or unless you subscribe to the Oxford Research Service, unless you are in a university type uh, library, you're not going to be able to get that, unfortunately. So many public libraries do have it. You should try. Your public library may have the, the, the Encyclopedia of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is there, is there something people can watch that's like a uh, PBS special um, about the well, Dead Sea Scrolls that will bring this to life? There, there are numerous videos on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of them you can find on my website if I'm on them. Some of them, the problem you have that there's some very good ones that have been done by Nova, a few of which are available free for, to watch. The NYU had a conference on Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to put this down to you, which is now totally online. It was aimed, aimed at the dead, general public. Uh, people like you, and uh, this, this is a four-day conference, and the whole thing is online now, and we'll send you the, uh, the, the link to that, and uh, the, 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 there is a good, but the, the truth of the matter is that the, the best thing is to read the good books on the subject, and that's, that, that requires either going to your library or some of these books, by the way, a lot of the public libraries right now, because of the coronavirus, have bought into systems that are giving them a lot more material online. And you may want to get some of that. And a lot of the stuff is available on Kindle and other downloadable means from there, you know, Amazon, et cetera. So uh, that's, that's a quick summary. So just a, a technical question from me, and then we have uh, some other questions that we'll go through in the next uh, five or 10 minutes. So the first is the Torah scroll that we see today, when we go to synagogue, we open it up. The letters are actually Aramaic Font, right. correct? Okay. The letters in the Dead Sea Scroll, as I think you've mentioned, are a mixture of ancient so Hebrew. They're mostly, the letters in the Dead Sea Scrolls are mostly Aramaic, as you say them, right? What we call the Assyrian script or the Kitab Ashuri, and some of them, a small number, are in the Old Hebrew script. So my question has always been, since we have, we don't, we assume that the original scrolls were written in in an ancient Hebrew, right? And yeah. then, then it was translated using the uh, Aramaic font. And in that translation, um, isn't that a translation, I guess, in which case what we have today is really a translation of an original document that we no, use. No, it's not a translation, it's a tra uh, transliteration. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, but yes, but it's exactly the same alphabet. Transliteration is like you write Hebrew and English. But in that, in, in, that, in, in that transition, just wondering if you could argue there were changes. But, or well, if can't, was, we can't know anything about what happened then. But what we can know is the Bible lists 22 books that were lost probably because of the change of the script. They will never know what they are. The Book of the, of the Wars of the Lord, the Chronicles of the Kings of Judea, the Chronicles of all these books that they mentioned that we don't have. But I don't know. We can't know what happened in the, in, in the fourth let's say about 450 when that transition was made. We just can't know. I just find it funny that when we, people say that we're looking at the Torah, we're looking at Hebrew, which I guess technically we are, but we're actually looking at non-Hebrew letters. And our, our Hebrew today is yeah, not This really became Hebrew. the Hebrew script. Hebrew changed the script. That's like, that's like, you know, saying if you're reading Turkish in English script that you're not reading Turkish, but you are. That's the state of Turkish today to get rid of the Turkish alphabet or German. Right, that you don't use the fraktor anymore from German. You would say you're not reading German. Of course, you're reading German. You're reading by the script of the Germans today, except as their script. Um, so I'll move on to Professor Hubbard. asks, Will you be discussing the identification of the teacher of righteousness in your in one of your upcoming programs? I, I for us. not exactly because I have no idea who the teacher of righteousness is. So therefore, okay. but we will talk about the teacher of righteousness, the leader of the sect. Yes. Question, are there any references to the Maccabees in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, they, they are probably anti-Maccabean polemics, or they did not like the Maccabees. And I would say that the Maccabees, for example, Jonathan the Hasmonean, perhaps Simeon, is called the Wicked Priest. And there are a variety of anti-Maccabean texts. And uh, before Hanukkah, you can do a whole lecture on all what we learn about the Maccabees from the scrolls. But it's not the Maccabees, Maccabees, it's the Hasmonean Empire after Judah was dead and after the revolt had ended. We have a, a Shema uh, fixated person in Michael in our group who wants to, who is very focused on the Shema and wants to know if there's any difference in the Shema between the three different versions, the Masoretic, 
and the two other oh, versions. Well, I have a great like piece of information for anyone interested in the Shema, which is that the reading of the Shema is mentioned in one of the sectarian texts, the rule of the community. No, can't hear you, sorry. What happened here? Everybody got muted, no? Oh, no, you, you, you froze. So if you could go back to what you were telling us about the Shema, that would be excellent. Oh, okay, I froze, okay. Uh, so I, I mentioned to you my computer this morning wasn't working, I'm using my laptop. My computer has a wire. My laptop is on the, uh, on the, the Wi-Fi. Okay, hopefully we'll have the computer back next time. So the, uh, the, as far as the Shema, we have a poem, which is the earliest mention of the recital of the Shema. And that mention of the recital of the Shema is in this poem. It's, all, it's not said directly, but it's pretty obvious to most scholars involved that that's what's being alluded to. And it's a poem at the end of the rule of the community, a very beautiful poem. Um, to your knowledge, have all of the fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls now been digitized and ha have they been analyzed is the, I guess the second question. Okay, as to digitized, all the fragments are digitized with a small, very, very, well, hold it a second. The ones that are in Jordan, that were on exhibit in Jordan, are digitized from old photos. We have new photos of all the other ones. So the answer is yes, although I, I think we may find that there are a couple of scraps still in a drawer somewhere in Israel that maybe we get on yet. But the answer in general is yes, everything is digitized at the either from the Israel Museum collection or the Israel Antiquities collection. And then the other thing question about whether they've all been analyzed, they've all been analyzed in some way. The question is, there's a lot more work to be done now. We have people working on computer programs to try and match fragments that may fit in places that we don't know yet. We have uh, just recently some words were discovered on what was thought to be blank parchment. So there's ongoing work being done but having said that, there's been an attempt to analyze everything. Um, I have a question from Howard Merowitz that I'm going to read. Have any Islamic scholars done this type of study of the Dead Sea Scrolls in relation to the Quran? If so, which versions of the Hebrew Bible are being quoted in the Quran? I have somewhere an, Arab, an, Arab, uh, an Arabic book on the scrolls, which was written way, way before any of the recent research that was done. I don't know of any Islamic real scholars working on the scrolls. There, you can find on internet some uh, stuff which is kind of, you know, amateurs writing about Islam and the Dead Scrolls. Um, I think we're almost out of time. And what's your uh, current research on with respect to the scrolls? Is there something you're okay. working on? Well, I just finished this, this massive work, new edition of the Temple Scroll. It was a project that was going on for 20 years. And I am, currently finishing some articles and a, uh, on the scrolls on different topics, one on the mikvah odit Qumran and relationship to the text, which is being actually finished right now. I have to finish one soon on uh, New Testament evidence for history of Judaism, which relates indirectly to Dead Sea Scrolls. And I am now setting off to write a new study, although I've previously written some, let's call episodic studies, but a completely full study of the Temple Scroll. So that's most of what I'm doing right now. Okay. Okay, everybody. I think we have a lot to digest, Professor Schiffman. You now the rest of the day we're going to have to watch this over and over again and and try to understand a lot. There's a lot that um, for us to follow up with. So I appreciate all the knowledge that you've given us. Uh, those of you who wanted the deep dive, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope everybody's enjoyed it, but in particular those who emailed me after the first program with Adolfo Reutemann. Um, you who have stayed till the end will know the most about the Dead Sea Scrolls of anybody in Orange County or in your communities after this three-part series. <laughs> so uh, go online, read some scrolls, take a look at what they look like. Get, you, you, because they're digitized, you can get really close to the letters. It's kind of cool if you know Hebrew, see if you can figure out what you can read. And um, Professor Shipman, thank you for uh, being with us. Okay. From You're okay welcome. You keep safe, everybody. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.